I, I do want to take just a moment and emphasize um, next Saturday, and I know that this sounds kind of strange and you don't find a lot of churches doing this anymore, and we haven't done it in the six years that I've been here, but one of the things that we've been trying to encourage you to do, of course, is, is to invite people and to share your faith uh, with people when you have that opportunity. And we want to try to make that kind of as easy as possible at times. Uh, we've got cards out there for you to take and drop off during the week. But uh, what we want to do Saturday, and, and it's, it's very, uh, I think anybody can do it, and we'd like to have about 20 people or more if we could. Uh, we're going to go across Blanding into the Constitution neighborhood. And all we're going to do, we're going to pair you up. And if we have enough folks, uh, we're going to put people at different points and work our way to the middle. You're just going to go up uh, to the door, knock on the door. If you see them working in the yard, whatever it is, you're just going to give them a card uh, that, that, that invites them to church. It has our upcoming sermon series. You're not there to get into a theological debate with them. You're not there to, all you do is to say, hey, we just want to drop this off. We're right across the street here. We'd love for you to be a part of our church and then move on from there. Uh, and so we're going to kind of do that Saturday. So if you can come for an hour or two, we would really appreciate it. Meet here at 9 o'clock, have prayer. We'll go out there. We'll hit the neighborhood. We want to do this again a little bit later on when we uh, are getting close to our um, uh, Veterans Day uh, service in November. We're going to have a Veterans Day service and a cookout that day, and we want to go to another neighborhood and do the same thing. So if you can come, bring your kids, that's fine. If they're real little, I, I don't watch them because we're going to be in neighborhoods. Um, and uh, But if you feel comfortable bringing your kids, especially teenagers, come and take part in that. That would be great. Um, we are finishing up our sermon series today that we've entitled FAT. Now remember, it's an acronym for Faithful available and teachable. Uh, if, if you, we, we've covered all three of those things. We, we've, over the past three sermons, we've looked at all three of those different characteristics. These are characteristics that followers of Christ must have in order to be transformed and to experience the growth that God wants to provide for us. These are characteristics that we have to have in order to be true disciples of Christ. Now, since we've covered all three of these, why are we doing a fourth sermon? Well, I want to kind of give you an object lesson this morning. I want to look at someone in the scriptures, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that I think exhibits these characteristics uh, that, that maybe allow us to see what it looks like instead of just hearing what these characteristics are supposed to be. Now, we need to understand that the key to all of these things is humility. The, the, the characteristic that affects faithfulness and being available and teachable is, is humbleness or, or, or humility. And we talked a little bit about that last week, but that's really what we're going to really focus on today is this concept of humility, looking at one of the characters in the Bible that exhibits that humility, which shows us the characteristics of faithful, available, and teachable. Now, look, humility is tough and always has been tough, partly because of our society. Our society has always taught us to be more concerned about self than anything else, to, to have that self-image, to, to feel great about yourself, even to compare yourself to other people. And then I remember as a kid, the big motto was grab, you know, grab the gusto. You know, it's got to be grab everything you can get for you. Um, I think what has even made humility a little bit harder in our society today is social media. I think social media causes us to have to talk about self, Facebook especially. We go on Facebook so that we can tell people what we're doing, what restaurant we're eating at. And that's really, I don't quite get it. I don't really need to know that you're at McDonald's. I'm glad you're there, but I don't need to know that. Or what movie you're going to, or that you're in the bathroom now at the movie. I don't need to know those things. But that's what it seems to me. Facebook has caused us to be more concerned about self, and we've convinced ourselves, and I hate to break the news to you, but we've convinced ourselves, everybody wants to know where we are every minute of the day. No, we don't. We don't. We, we, as long as you know where you are, that's what's concerning. Because if you don't, then we're really concerned about that. But, but uh, look, I ran across this picture on Facebook that I think summarizes this concept of it's about me. This is what someone put up on Facebook just this week. <clears throat> And they wrote the question, do you like this or not? Oh, who cares? <laughs> cover them up, whether they're short or long, cover it. But this is, this is what we've done. Look, you can go away from this now before people get sick. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so 
Look, if, if we are going to experience true transformation, true discipleship, we have to understand the concept of humility. And so let's, let's talk a little bit about that. The first thing I want to do is I want to try to motivate you. I, 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 look, motivation is the key to anything. If you want to do something, you will do it, and you will do it as well as you can. If you don't want to do something, you either won't do it, or if you do do it, you won't do it very well. You, you, you'll just kind of just give half the effort. Motivation is really the key. One of my favorite movies is Cinderella Man. Um, it's about a boxer during uh, the Depression by the name of uh, James Braddock. And uh, he went through a time where he really struggled boxing. He, he couldn't win any matches. Uh, but then right in the, in, in, at the height of the Depression, he began to win uh, his, his boxing uh, matches. And uh, he has a match for the heavyweight championship of the world. And before that match, he's at a press conference. And one of the newsmen asked, what's the difference? Well, why couldn't you win, but now you can't seem to lose. And, and James Braddock began to mention some things. Uh, he, he had been injured on a number of occasions in a car accident at one time. But then he said, I know what I'm fighting for now. And the newscaster said, what's that? And he said, milk. It's one of the greatest lines I've ever heard, milk. You see, before he was fighting for money and fame. Now he's fighting for food for his kids. And that's what made him a much better boxer. So motivation becomes so important. So let me see if I can motivate you when it comes to the characteristic of humility, which we have to have in order to have these other characteristics. Look at these scriptures that we find. One is in 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. James 4, 10 says, humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. I think we like exalt better, don't we? It almost seems to be contradictory. Humble yourself and God will exalt you. Now, I don't know that I can explain specifically how God exalts us when we humble ourselves. I don't know that I can give you specifics. I don't know if it means that if you humble yourself, he's going to give you prosperity or he's going to give you good health or he's going to help you through tough times or he's going to help you accomplish uh, maybe a dream uh, that you've had for years, or maybe he brings something into your life that you didn't expect. I, I don't know. All I know is the promise is this, that if we humble ourselves, God will bless us. He's going to bless us in some way or another. There's a story that I heard years ago, had to be 15 years ago, and when I was thinking about this humility, it, it, I, I thought, man I, man, I really like this story, but I couldn't remember all of it. I was missing bits and pieces of the story, so I, be, I went on online to find it. Normally you can find that story and Man, I spent probably <clears throat> uh, an hour uh, uh, th throughout the week trying to find this story, and I just couldn't find it. So actually yesterday during um, Chris's uh, halftime of his ball game, uh, which at that point Florida was still winning, so if I knew they were going to lose the second half, I would have sent it to him then. But I said, can you go find this for me? And he wrote back, he said, I can't find it. So I thought, okay, I'll scrap it. It's not a big deal. Got here this morning, began working through my sermon, and I remembered the story. And, and it goes like this. There was a gentleman really down on his luck. He, he, he doesn't have any money, uh, doesn't have a job. <clears throat> the place that he's staying, uh, most likely he's going to lose it very soon. But he, he hears about a job opening at a bank to be a custodian, be a janitor. So he goes to the bank. He meets with the bank manager. He shares his experiences. And the bank manager says, well, I, I like you. He said, what we got to do is we got to fill out some information uh, the application, and then we kind of move it forward. So he put the application in front of the young man, and he said, I, I can't fill this out. And he said, well, why not? He said, because I can't read. And the bank manager said, you can't read? He goes, no. He said, well, I, you know, I'm sorry, but you can't get the job. I, I mean, you got to be able to read to have this job. He said, I'm, I'm really sorry. I wish I could hire you, but I can't. So the, the gentleman got up a little bit dejected. He was getting ready to leave, and the bank manager stopped him and said, look, I, I'm really sorry. I wish I could do something, but the best I can do is, here's a, here's a bag of apples. I give them to you. Take them. You know, I hope that you find what you're looking for, and you can get things right in your life again. So the gentleman leaves the bank, begins to walk down the street. He goes about down three or four blocks. It's a pretty busy area, big town, and he thinks to himself, you know what? I'm going to sell these apples. Make some money, sell the apples. So he stopped on this corner, began to sell these apples. Sold the whole bag. Took that money, went and bought another bag. Sold that bag. Next thing he did, the, next day he did the very same thing. Got a bag of apples, began to sell them, bought some more. Before he knew it, 
he had a little apple stand on the corner of this street, this very busy street in this big town, and he's doing very well. After five years, he had earned $500,000. Now, he didn't know very much about life. He was just keeping this money in his little apartment. And a friend of his found out that he was and said, you, you can't do that. You got to go put that in the bank somewhere. So the gentleman said, okay. So he goes back to that bank. He walks in. He sits down. A different person comes, a bank attendant. He says, I want to open a bank account. He says, great. Love to have you. He said, how much you want to start with? He said, $500,000. He said, wait a minute. Tell me again how much you have. $500,000. I got $500,000 cash I want to give you. The man said, that's wonderful. He got the paperwork out, laid it for him. So you got to fill out this form. The man said, I can't. He said, why not? He said, because I can't read. He said, you can't read? He said, no. He said, you're telling me you can't read and you've earned $500,000? And the man said, yes. He said, do you know where you would be if you could read? He goes, yes, I'd be the custodian at this bank. <clears throat> now, I, for some reason, that sticks with me as being humble and God exalting you. Look, I don't know how he will exalt you, but what I do know is that God has said that if we are humble, that he will lift us up just at the right time. He will bring the blessings into our life that he has in store for us. So I begin to think about the different people in the Bible that God had exalted because of their humbleness. What about David? When we first read about David, this, this guy is, realize how humble he was? Here comes the prophet in to anoint the next king, goes to David's house, goes to David's father. And they begin to parade all the brothers. And each time the prophet said, well, this is the one. And God said, no, that's not. There's no more brothers left. And he says, Jesse, the father, David's father, do you have any more sons? Yeah, but you don't want him. He's just a scrawny little guy out watching sheep. He said, bring him in. When he came in, the prophet looked at him and thought, this can't be the guy God wants. And God said, no, 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 stop looking on the outside. I look on the inside. Do you realize how humble he was? He was a shepherd, a shepherd. He hung out with sheep all day long. In fact, he wasn't even in the house when they were going to anoint the next king of Israel. And yet God exalts him to be probably the greatest king Israel ever experienced. What about the Gentile woman in the New Testament? The Gentile woman that goes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, my daughter is sick. Will you heal her? And Jesus says, wait a minute. You don't know what you're asking me. I'm here to preach to God's chosen people. I'm here to do miracles for the Jews. That's like asking me to take food from the kids and give it to the dogs. And she makes one of the most humblest statements in all the Bible. She says, yeah, but even some scraps fall off the table for the dogs. You know what she just said? I'm a dog. You're right, Jesus. I'm worthless. I'm just looking for some scraps. And Jesus goes, you know what? This is the greatest faith I've ever seen in Israel. Your daughter is healed. What about Moses? Did you know this was in the Bible? Look at Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. And Moses was very humble. More humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Did you know that? That Moses was the most humblest man on the face of the earth. Really? Well, you have to understand the story of Moses for a minute. When we read it from the Bible, it, it's a great story, but... When you look at some of the historians like Josephus and Philo who wrote in the first and second century, they give us some insights about Moses we'd never seen before. Josephus writes that an angel came to Moses' parents and told them that Moses was going to be special. Moses probably knew at some point growing up that God had a special purpose for him. Another historian teaches us that Moses probably was a general of one of Pharaoh's army. This guy had everything. He had everything you could want. He had money, he had power, he had influence, everything. But yet he knew that God had a special purpose for him. So what's he do? One day he decides, uh, I'm going to take care of this. So he goes out and he kills one of the Egyptian slave masters. He thinks that all of Israel is going to follow him. But they don't. And so he takes off. He leaves. He flees. And he spends 40 years, and the Bible says that he became a shepherd. Why is that important? Because back in Genesis chapter 31, we are told that the Egyptians hated shepherds. Hated them. But God is going to use him to go back and lead his people. A shepherd. Forty years he becomes a shepherd. No more commanding of an army, commanding of sheep. 
He learns to be humble during those 40 years. And then here's where it gets interesting. When God finally decides to call Moses, he calls him through the burning bush. Remember that story? Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, Moses begins to give a list of excuses. And for years, I always thought that that's what he was doing, was giving excuses. I don't think so. I think he was being humble. I think Moses, after 40 years, was learning what humbleness was because God says, I want you to go and be my deliverer. 40 years earlier, Moses would have said, let's do it, God. I'm ready now. Let's take out these Egyptians. But why 40 years later? Because if Moses would have done it when Moses wanted to do it, who would have got the glory? Moses. But who gets the glory 40 years later? God does. Why? Because Moses has learned to be humble. He's not giving excuses there at the burning bush. He's exhibiting humbleness. He's come to understand, I can't do anything without God. And here's what's really interesting. One of the reasons that he says that he can't be the deliverer is because he doesn't speak well. Yet in Acts chapter 7, verse 22, Luke says that Moses was wise in all the Egyptian ways and powerful in speech. What's the difference? He was humble. He needed God. But the person I really want to look at is John the Baptist. So I want you to go with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, and what we're going to do is you're going to hold your finger there for a minute, and we're going to also go to Matthew chapter 11. So go ahead and get John 3 and then put your finger at Matthew chapter 11. Let me just give you a little insight here. First of all, the event in Matthew follows the event in John. So John chronologically is first. Matthew is is second in, in, in the history of things. Here's what we know about John the Baptist. From, from birth, he had the Holy Spirit in him. Remember, his mother was barren. God does a miracle and says, Elizabeth, you're going to have a child. And this child's going to be special. How special? Well, uh, he's, he's going to be the forerunner uh, of the Messiah. And he's going to take a vow, uh, a Nazarite vow, certain things he can't do, certain things he can't do for the rest of his life. And the reason for this vow is because he has the Holy Spirit living within him. The other thing that we know about him is that he's very popular. Very, very popular. The crowds followed him. In fact, on a couple of occasions when the Pharisees came out, see, when, when, when he comes out of the wilderness, John the Baptist begins preaching, the crowds begin to follow him. Some of the, some of the Pharisees come out to hear what he's preaching, and he looks at him and he says, you brood of vipers, who told you to come here? Well, why are you running away from the wrath of God? And, and the first question he asks is, why don't they stop him? Uh-uh, they're not dumb. They, they know if they stop him, they, they're going to have a revolt on their hand. It's interesting, last night as I was waiting for, for my team, uh, the, the Florida State uh, Junior High School team to play, because um, <clears throat> they're really bad this year. Um, uh, but there was a rain delay. Uh, they did an interview with Bobby Bowden. Now, Bobby Bowden is considered one of the greatest coaches of all time, whether you like Florida State or not. He, he, he probably is, uh, if, if not the greatest, one of the greatest. And they did an interview with him, and they were talking about um, when he resigned. And he said, look, here's what you need to understand. Uh, I wanted to coach one more year, just one more year. That's all I wanted. But the school didn't want me to coach one more year, so they gave me an option. I could either resign or they could fire me. He said, now, all I wanted was one more year. He said, now, I could have got fired, but the reason I resigned is that I knew that if I got fired, the town would have tore that college apart. That's what he said. He probably was correct. He said, my worst concern was for that school and for the city of Tallahassee because I love the school and I love this city. So I decided to resign. That was John the Baptist. That's how popular he was. There was no way that any of the Pharisees or religious leaders were going to question John because the crowds follow him. So we know that he had the Holy Spirit from birth. We know that he was very popular. But there's something else that we need to know. Look, if you would, at Matthew chapter 11. In this particular passage, John the Baptist is in prison. He's been put there because of his faithfulness. Now remember, faithfulness is that you do what God says to do. You live out the Christian message no matter what's happening. The reason that he is in prison is because he was bold enough to say to Herod, look, you are wrong for having sex with your brother's wife. And so they threw him in prison. He was being faithful with the word of God. Well, while in prison, John says to his disciples, I need you to go find Jesus and find out if he really is the Messiah. Well, they do. And Jesus says, I'm him. Go back and tell John I'm the one. 
Then here's what Jesus says to the crowd. Matthew chapter 11, starting with verse um, 8. Uh, but we'll start in the middle of verse 7. What did you go out to, to the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Uh, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. And I tell you one more than a prophet. This is written about him. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. So here's what we know about John the Baptist. Has the Holy Spirit from, the, from, from birth, and he has a special purpose. He's going to be the, the forerunner of the Messiah. The crowds love him, and Jesus now has called him more than a prophet and the greatest man ever to be born. You think he was tempted at times to have a little pride, to get a little puffed up, to feel a little bit more about himself than maybe what he should? Now go to John chapter 3. Let's look what happens in John chapter 3. We're going to begin with verse 22. John 3, 22. After this, Jesus and disciples went out to Judea countryside where he spent time with some and baptized. Now, now John was baptizing to give us an area uh, because there's plenty of water. People were constantly coming to be baptized. We're talking about John the Baptist. This was before John was in prison, which is what we just read about in chapter 11. An argument developed between some of John the Baptist's disciples and a certain Jew, one man, over the matter of ceremonial washing. What are we talking about? Baptism. John would baptize as a sign of your repentance. Verse 26, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the man who is with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, that's Jesus. Well, he's baptizing and everyone is going to him. You see what just happened? So John's over here baptizing. He's got a large crowd, but Jesus now is baptizing just down the river sun. And this Jew comes and begins to, to talk to the disciples to say, look, man, they're all going to Jesus now. Why, why? Why would John allow that to happen? Man, John's popular. John's got a great message. So his disciples go to John and say, John, why are we allowing this to happen? We need to fix this. What we, you know, this is a problem here. Now, I have to tell you, folks, the application maybe isn't for you as much as it is for me. But this really hit me between the eyes. This really caused me some problems. About a month ago, Lisa wanted to go down and visit a friend of hers in Kissimmee uh, that she hadn't seen in probably 20 years, but was one of her very best friends growing up. So I took her down there. Now, <clears throat> I, I didn't want to sit in the house and listen to them talk about all the things in their life years ago. So I went to a golf course, and then I messed around a little bit, and then I went over to the Bible college. And I went to talk to Mike Chambers, which is... I, I would consider him president chambers, but he's the, he's the provost of the college there. And, and Mike was one of my professors uh, when I was at the college. And so he came out, he took me back in the office, and we sat down, we began to talk a little bit, and he said, how are things going, Jim? And I said, hey, I'm struggling right now, Mike. He said, what's the problem? I said, I'm really having a problem with the kingdom mentality. I really am. I, I'm, I'm struggling with other churches. I, I just don't get why... You know, we're, we're a little bit stagnant, but, you know, there's, there's churches in our backyard that seems to be growing left and right. And there, there, there are churches that aren't really preaching the gospel, or at least they're not very strong with the gospel, and they seem to be growing. And I said, I'm just really struggling with kingdom mentality right now. And he gave me some words of encouragement. This week, instead of words of encouragement, God just decided to hit me between the eyes when it came to this concept. And that is, stop it. Stop it. God has me exactly where he wants to have me. I, I've never been a minister of a mega church. There are times that I thought, man, I would love, I would love to come out every Sunday morning and preach to a thousand people and have four services, each one of them with a thousand or more. I would love to have Chris, when he finishes the praise team, move my robe over so that everyone would... <laughs> no. I don't know. There's times I've thought about that, but... I look back on my 35 years in the ministry and, and, and I think where God has always placed me is where the word of God needed to be preached without compromise. And sometimes that means, you know, I'm a big church. That's all right. It's okay. It might be in a church of 40. We've been there. It might be in a church of 150. Been there. 
Might be in church of 300. I don't know. But I'm amazed at John's response to this. It is a response of humility. Let's look at it. The first thing he says is that you got to understand, guys, God's in control. Verse 27. To this John replied, a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. It, 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 God's in control. I'm doing what God wants me to do. If he doesn't want me to baptize as many as he wanted me to baptize last year, that's okay. Jesus is baptizing more. That works out fine. Humility recognizes that God is in control. The second one is verse 28. He says, you need to understand that everyone is significant, but there is only one, only one that takes first place. Verse 28, you yourself can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent ahead of him. John says, look, I'm I'm doing what I was called to do. There's always only one, Jesus Christ, who has the priority. My job is to do what God wants me to do. And you know what? It's not insignificant. Now, this does have application to you. Many of you aren't available for God to use a lot of times because you think it's maybe not important enough to do. I'm telling you it is. Every ministry that God calls you to is significant. Now, I know the majority of you would say, well, I'd be glad to do this as long as I don't have to do something in the spotlight. And I can appreciate that. But I have to tell you, I think a lot of times that's just an excuse not to do a ministry. It's not because you have a problem with the spotlight. It's because they just don't want to do ministry. Because, look, some folks have to do the spotlight ministries as well. But the fact is, humility understands that whatever God calls me to do is significant, but there's only one who has the first place. A third thing he says that is a statement of humility is that joy comes because of obedience. Look, if you would, in verse 29, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friends who attend the bridegroom wait and listen for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. The joy is mine and is now complete. The reason we struggle with this verse is because our weddings are different than back then. The most important person in the wedding back then was the best man. Today, it's the wedding director. The wedding director decides everything, right? That it doesn't matter. I mean, have you ever had a really strong wedding director? Yeah, you know, the bride says, I'd like to come down that aisle. No, you're coming down this aisle. So the one you're coming down to. Okay, that's, then I'll come down this one. Okay. Look, but back then it was the best man. The best man was responsible to get everything planned, to make sure that the wedding was ready to go off, to make sure that, that you had uh, the announcements out, Uh, that everyone in the town knew, to make sure the reception, make sure the food was there, the wine was there, everything was there. The best man had that responsibility. And then when the marriage was finally official, the bridegroom would speak. And when he did, the best man rejoiced because he had been obedient. He had done everything he was supposed to do to make sure that the wedding would take place. That's what John says. Look, I'm nothing more than the best man. And my greatest joy is when I heard that Jesus was here. Joy is found in obedience, folks. The concept of humility goes hand in hand with obedience. When you learn to be obedient, then you will learn to be humble because to be obedient, you have to be humble to the one that is giving the commands. And the last thing, which is the crux of humility, it is the key, is verse 30. Humility means that we draw attention to God. Verse 30. He must become greater, I must become less. What a powerful statement by John the Baptist. You got your finger in Matthew chapter 11? Flip back for a minute. Let me show you two things that are really interesting in this passage. I didn't finish reading verse 11, so let me finish reading it. Again, Matthew 11, verse 11. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, this is Jesus talking about John the Baptist, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist yet, He who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Amazing. He just said what John lived. Christ must be greater. I must be less. And then look if you would starting in verse 4, because I had never seen this before. I love when I find things I'd never seen before. Jesus replies, now the apostles, John's disciples have come and said, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one? We're waiting for Look how Jesus replied. You go back and report to John. What you hear and see, 
The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Now look at verse 4. This is amazing. Blessed or happy is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Blessed is John that when he sees me baptizing more people than he's baptizing, he doesn't lose faith. He doesn't walk away. He doesn't throw it in. He doesn't quit. Blessed is the man who sees God doing greater things to other people and yet is able to rejoice because God is doing it, not the person. Blessed is the one who does not fall away because Christ decides to work in a different way than maybe we want him to do and we feel like we're left behind. You're not. You are significant. You are important. Do your ministry. Work hard. But humility, let me tell you what humility, folks, is. The humility is focusing on Jesus Christ as the most important thing in your life. That's humility. See, we think humility, we think, we think it's the opposite of pride. And we think that pride is where we walk around and we boast about who we are. That, that's not. That's not the issue. That, that, very, very few people do that. There's very few Muhammad Ali's walking around today going, I am the greatest of all time. That, there's, there, that's not who people are today. Because we don't understand humility. Humility is when we don't allow God to be God because we want to take his place. Well, I don't do that. Yes, you do. Yes, I do. We do that. We take God off the throne. When we do that, that's pride. We lose our humility. And when we do that, we cannot grow. We cannot be transformed. We cannot experience discipleship. Think about it for a minute. Humility relates to faithfulness in this way. Faithfulness means that I am going to do everything God asked me to do. The Christian message is going to live through me. It's going to affect my language. It's going to affect my action. It's going to affect everything. Faithfulness is that I do what God wants me to do in every area. Humility says, I'll do it. Pride says, God, I'll do this, but not this. I don't like this command, God. I don't agree with this command. Well, I see it teach, God, but you know what? That's not what I've been taught before. And I see what you say. And all of a sudden, you know what we've done? We've taken God off the throne. We've put ourselves up there. Humility rates with, uh, uh, relates to availability. When we say, you know what, God? Use me wherever you want me to be. I, I know that I might not think I can do it. And I know, Father, I think there are other people who maybe can do it better. But if you're calling me to that ministry, I'm going to do it, God. And humility says, I'll do it. Pride says, you know what, God? Uh, I'm too busy. You know, God, I'm sure there are other people that can do it better than me. And we take God off the throne. And we're not available anymore. And teachability. Oh, my goodness, you cannot have teachability without humility. You can't. It's impossible. Because teachability says, I don't know. Help me to know. I can't do it on my own. Help me to do it. Tell me what to do it. And one of the ways that God teaches us is through people. He brings people into our life to encourage us, to build us up, but also to hold us accountable and to point out things in our life that we need to see. That's what humility is, and that's what teachability is. It's where we make ourselves available so that people can minister to us and help us in our walk. And what begins to happen is we say, uh-uh, I'm good, I'm fine, I don't need that, I don't want that, please. And all of a sudden it's because we don't have the humility to be teachable. You know, last week I told you about this new program, and it's really hard for me to call it a program because it, it's, so, it, it, it's, it's so spontaneous. It has to be uh, spontaneous for it to work. Discipleship isn't, isn't really something you do. It's something you become. And, 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 and so we see a little structure, but we see a lot of, a lot of just botanity to it. I mean, Jesus discipled his followers, just as they would walk during the day and he would point out things to them and use it to teach them. Hey, see that man over there sowing those seeds? Let me tell you about people that sow seeds. All right. Hey, see that man over there with, talking to his son? Let me tell you about the story about the son that ran away. He's discipling them as he's walking along, but there is some structure to it because he chose these men to disciple and so I mentioned that we want to try to develop some discipleship groups of about three or four people that, that come together on a regular basis, women and, and, and men, not, not 
intermixed, but, but different because we, we have different needs. And so we, we made that available. We told you about it last week, remember? And we asked you to sign up. We're asking you to do the same thing today, to sign up on the back of your card. Here's what's interesting. A number of people signed up. And I'm really excited about that. But probably over 90% of the ones that signed up were women, which is good. I'm glad. But it made me think, why didn't the men sign up? I'm not stopping and asking for directions. I don't need that instructions to put that playground together. I don't need it. And that's what we do, man. That's what we do. We don't get involved. I don't need it. I'm, I'm, so, now look, understand, I, I don't think that everyone, I would love for everyone to be a part of a discipleship group. I, I would. But I, I know that not, doesn't happen in the church. And, and I'm not telling you that you have to be a part of a discipleship group to go to heaven. That's not true either. And you don't have to be a part of the one that we try to put together. Maybe you bring other people into your own life. Maybe there are folks that you're close with already that you can have that discipleship. But what I'm saying to you is if the reason you're not is because you're not teachable, uh, you'll never be transformed and grow in your relationship to Christ. You're it. Where you are right now is it. You're done. If, you, if, you, if you're not humble enough to be teachable, then God can't transform you. And if you're not humble enough to allow people to encourage you and even hold you accountable, then you're going to keep fighting with the same sin, the same problem over and over. Here's the key right here. This is it. If we are going to be disciples, we have to be humble. In order to be humble, we have to be occupied with Jesus Christ. He has to be the focus in everything in our life. And when you're occupied, look, you cannot make yourself humble. You can't. Humility comes out of being occupied with Jesus Christ. It just comes out naturally. It flows naturally. It allows you to ask the question, what are the things that I'm doing that I need to stop? Or what are the things that I should be doing that I need to start? What are the struggles that I'm dealing with that I'm not willing to admit? What are the things that I'm trying to control that I know I can't control? That's what discipleship does. When we come together and we share with one another, we love on each other and we embrace each other and we open up our lives to each other. And I'm not saying to everybody in the church, that's a scary thing. But when there are two or three that we can open ourselves up to and say, man, I need help in this, that's when you're faithful. And that's when you're available. And that's when you're teachable. Because that is when you're humble. Oh, and the good news? If you humble yourself, he will exalt you.